Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Cleveland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Tor Talk Weekly Parsha. One of my settings just jumped. I had to go fix that. Anyway, Tor Talk Weekly Parsha. Welcome back, Rabbi Rafi Mullet. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us again here as usual, and uh, looking forward to this week's Parsha. Yeah, great to be here. Great to be back. Thank you so much for having me, as usual. Yay. And yes. My my prayer is that Hashem should open my mouth to say His praises and the right words come out, God willing. So Perfect here we show. are. Very good. So Our I know you're on a tight schedule Shemos. today, so I won't I won't tie the you up. Of, I'll uh, let you get right the into it. New book it. of Shemos. Yes, sir. And uh, isn't it exciting to start a new book of the Torah? It is. It is. And uh, thank God, we had already um, we we started together. The book of Numbers, the book of uh, Deuteronomy, Genesis, and now we're on to our, our fourth book, starting from the beginning, Berkashem. together, uh, the book of Shemos, Exodus. So it's, a, it's an exciting place to be. Agreed. Agreed. Very good. All right. William, am, am I ready to charge your head? You are ready to roll. Yes, sir. You go right on ahead. All righty. So... Exodus begins with a little bit of a recap, a little bit of a recap of the events at the end of the book of Genesis. Uh, Shemos means the names of, because it begins, Eilish Shemos, Ben Israel, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt, etc. And it, and it names them, the 70 souls who came down. And, uh, you know, it's a, a strange thing to repeat, and this is something that we mentioned in our class, I believe, on the book of, of uh, the Parsha of Devarim, the very beginning of the book of Numbers, that the intro to each one of the books of the Torah is kind of like a, a certain mission statement. And they all kind of align. And that was the class, if you go back to the, 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 uh, the um, Bamidbar, Parsha's Bamidbar, the beginning of the book of Numbers, you'll see the class about how we find that every opening statement of the Torah is a statement of God's love. So, you know, go go check it out over there. But this is likewise, just to remind ourselves, this is likewise that. The names are repeated, and why repeat them? So he said the commentaries say because even though God counted them in the book of Genesis, so to speak, in their life, in their lifetime, now in the book of Exodus, when, when we're hearing about the generation following the souls who came down to Egypt, God counts them again, so to speak, even in death. And again, to show how beloved these righteous people were, that he wanted to count them again, not only in number, but also in name. And this may come up again, again, depending how the class goes. It always seems to take on a life of its own, no matter what I prepare. So I won't, I won't promise anything and not deliver, but it, it may become relevant later, depending where I get in the class. So... It, Famously, we know the story, the generation that came down to Egypt dies, and what follows is a new pharaoh, it says, that did not know Joseph. It's very hard not to know Joseph, who was the savior of Egypt, but some of the commentaries say that means he, he made himself as though he didn't know. It means he didn't recognize, and that's going to be very relevant to what we're going to say shortly. Asher lo yada as Yosef, it says in... in uh, in the Hebrew, he didn't know Joseph doesn't necessarily mean like he knew he didn't know. It means that he made himself as though he didn't recognize, he didn't recognize the significance of Joseph to Egypt that he ignored. He ignored the personage of Yosef and what what he did meant. And because he ignored that, he blocked it out of his psyche. He was able to do the types of things that he did. Had he paid mind to the the deeds of Joseph, he never would have carried out the atrocities that he did. So that he didn't know Joseph means that he didn't pay proper mind and recognition to the actions of Joseph who came before him. And in any event, he he becomes he becomes worried about the Jewish problem, the Jewish problem that uh, they were becoming very numerous, the Torah says, and this Pharaoh was, was paranoid. And he said, there's so many Jews, what's gonna be if they, 
join with one of our enemies. They'll take over the country, right? You could you could write this in 2023, right? You could write this in 2023. As I'm preparing this class, I'm thinking about Dave Chappelle's Saturday Night Live stand-up routine, you know? He's like, you know, I've been to Hollywood and there's a lot of Jews. There's a lot of Jews, you know, like, it sounds like Pharaoh, you know, they're gonna they're taking over they, because the Jews control everything. Straight out of the straight out of the Torah. We're living in Torah times. So he com concocts his uh, his scheme to enslave the Jews. And there's a lot of details there that we won't spend time on. The Jews nevertheless become more numerous. It says the more workload they put on them, the more numerous they became, the exact opposite of what they expected. They wanted the Jews to be so tired and exhausted and broken from their work that they wouldn't have the, the strength to, to raise families and to have children. But the opposite happened. And how, how such a thing could happen in the opposite way is very beautiful. That wasn't what I planned to talk about, so we could save that for another time. But... Pharaoh saw it wasn't working, okay. The, the Jews are still multiplying, time to start exterminating. So he, he first he employs the Jewish midwives and tries to do an inside job. Listen, when the babies are born, just, you know, strangle the males and say, whoa, what do you know? He died, sorry. You know, and they won't, they won't realize what's being done. But the midwives don't comply. And the midwives are, are, are I mean, they're human. They're, they're normal. They're like, I, I'm not going to commit murder. But they made an excuse. They said, yeah, the Jewish, the Jewish women, they're, they're able to give birth without a midwife. By the time we get there, the babies are born. They're not like the Egyptian women. We were unsuccessful in your plan. He says, okay, I'm done uh, beating around the bush. Take the males, throw them in the river. Now, why does he choose to throw them in the river, of all things? That's, a story, again, a story that I, I'm not planning to go into the details. Be that as it may, we know that uh, Yocheved, the mother of Moshe, she's married to Amram. This is a, a great person in the tribe of Levi. And they have two children, Miriam, six years old, Aaron, is three years old. And now during the time of this decree of the new babies, Moshe is born Moses, but he's not called Moses. He's a baby. Baby's born. And... They have to hide the baby. Soon they realize they can't hide it anymore. The Egyptians are, are looking out. They had all kinds of devious schemes and ways of discovering babies. Again, details we're not planning to go into doing, during this hour. And finally, she decides that she's going to put the baby in this basket, as we know, put him on the river, the Nile River, and I don't know what was the plan. Pray for the best, hope for the best. The truth is there was a very clever plan here, but again, those are details I'm not planning to go into. The story, we know she puts the baby on the river hoping for a salvation for this child. And, and perhaps subconsciously knowing that this child himself would be the salvation for them. And we have in verse chapter 2, verse 5 of the book of Exodus, that uh, Miriam the sister of baby goes among the, she's among the reeds there in the, uh, by the Nile. She's watching her baby brother from afar, from the distance, looking, kind of watching over him, making sure he's going to be safe, wondering what's going to happen. And what happens, lo and behold, we find in verse five, chapter two, verse five, it says that the daughter of Pharaoh herself, she descends to the Nile river to bathe. And it says, and her maidens were walking alongside the Nile. And she saw this box, and he was called a teva, which, by the way, is the same word as Noah's Ark. It's called te a teva. Teva basically means a container, okay? doesn't mean a boat. <laughs> um, it's an ark. It's a container, but it's a little one, okay? This little basket on the, on the water. Among the reeds, it says. And then it says this in Hebrew, Vatishlach es ama so. She sent her ama. She sent her ama. That's the Hebrew word. She sent her ama. And she took it. She took the teva, the little box. Now, what is an ama? Now, it so happens that an ama in the Torah is a word used for a maidservant, 
a female servant is called an ama. So it sounds like she sent her servant. Say, servant, go get the box. And the servant took the box. Now, um, the strange thing about that is that where was the servant? So it says that her maidens were walking along the Nile with her, right? But the word for maidens is not the same as the word that's used here, ama. It says the word there for the maidens is na'aros. Now, na'aros is plural for na'ara. Na'ara is feminine for na'ar. A na'ar could mean a young man. And, a, and therefore, a na'ara could mean a young woman, a maiden. It's also a word used for servant. It is. A na'ara, a, 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 this word na'ar, which means young man, could also mean like young man servant. Could be used that way. So like a lad. They call that a lad in English. A lad and a maiden. Right? So it could be just mean a young man or a young woman. It could also mean a servant. So why does the word change? If this is just one of her servants, why does in the same verse call them at one time a na'ara, a maiden, and then an ama, a maid servant? Why does it change the word? So our sages see here a hint that the word is changed to have another connotation. And that is that an ama, for those who know, is also used much more frequently in the Torah, much more frequently than it's used for maidservant. It's used to mean a cubit. A cubit is a measure that is somewhere between a foot and a half and two feet um, for you Americans. And, and, and it's essentially also, like why is a foot called a foot? Because somebody's foot measured like that. So now it became the measure of a foot. And I think in England they have hands, right? Uh, so an ama is actually also a body part. And that is the length from one's elbow or, or from, a, from a person's elbow to the tip of their long finger is an ama. And it's called a cubit. So this cubit that's relatively larger than that, you know, the foot and a half to two feet is, you know, obviously a standard cubit from somebody big. But either way, that's an ama. So the idea of she sent her ama means that she stretched out her arm to get the basket. Also very, also very plausible. We find this phraseology around the Torah slightly differently. Like when Abraham uh, binds Isaac upon the altar and he takes the knife, it says he sent his hand and took the knife. He said, so sending the hand is a phrase that's used in the Torah for taking something. But again, even if we look at it that way, it doesn't say she sent her hand. It says she sent her ama, like her her forearm, essentially. She sent her forearm. And it's also, like we said, a unit of measure. So what is the strange wording over here? So here our sages teach an incredible thing. It's literally incredible. They say that she stretched out to reach it, and she was unable to reach it. Her arm wasn't long enough. It didn't measure the length from where she was on her side of the river to reach where it was among the reeds somewhere maybe on the other side. So she stretched and stretched and stretched her arm and miraculously her arm stretched beyond its measure and it reached the basket by way of her mir a miracle that her arm literally sp stretched out to reach it. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? Now, number one, you could say, what? That sounds crazy. And it does kind of. And also number two, I mean, there's much bigger miracles in the Torah, but those miracles are pretty explicit. So if there was a miracle over here, why wasn't the Torah more explicit? Why didn't it you know, say it more clearly? And number two, why is this even necessary? Like, why is this an important detail? Just say she took it. She could reach it. She couldn't read it. It reached it. It stretched. It didn't stretch. In the end of the day, what do I learn from this? What am I meant to learn from this? So in general, when we find the Midrashim that use a hyperbolic language, language that seems like sort of larger than life, the approach of many of the commentaries is to understand that it's hinting to something more uh, beyond, let's call metaphysical. 
beyond the physical. So there is a lesson to be learned over here, even if we don't literally understand the story that her arm physically stretched out. Although anything's possible, I'm not ruling it out. Anything's possible, but what am I meant to gain from this reading of the sages of this verse that seems to go against the grain of the plain meaning? So what I wanted to share with you, I believe I heard this many years ago from my Rebbe, Rabbi Wallerstein, who had so, or Zechariah Wallerstein, he had so many beautiful insights on the Torah and specifically Shmos and these, these chapters, so many things that I, I took away with me and that helped me during that period. He said, he said the lesson is that when something seems out of reach, you don't give up. You stretch and you stretch with all your might and you try with everything you have to, to get there and God can make a miracle and God can make you achieve it. And how true is it? How true is it? So many times we doubt ourselves. So many times we want to give up. So many times we think something is impossible for us. It's out of our reach. It's unrealistic. We'll never achieve it. And a lot of that is our own self-doubt and our own self negativity thought that we we feed ourselves this language of I can't I'm not good enough but we we even if that's our true perception of it the Torah is telling us the sages are seeing here a lesson never give up reach for your goal reach for your dream reach beyond your limit and you'd be shocked you'd be shocked what you could you could accomplish and we've seen this from other people and we've probably seen it from ourselves when we really push and we really stretch ourselves beyond what we think we're capable of, we surprise ourselves and we, and we achieve. And that's the message over here. Don't give up on something because it seems out of reach. You can do it. Put everything you have into it. And Hashem can bridge that gap. You can accomplish way more than you think. And how is such a thing possible? How is such a thing possible that we could accomplish more than seems possible for us. And the key is what I'm about to show you now. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. I'm gonna fast forward to chapter, chapter, I gotta go through my notes a little bit. Hey, where are my notes? I'm missing it. Um, okay, unfortunately, it's missing from my notes. So now I gotta look it up because I don't have such a good memory for chapters and verses. But bear with me. I'm going to find it. I believe it's in chapter 3. Verse. Mm, I'm scanning. I'm going to find it. But I'll tell you the story, meanwhile, while I'm looking for it. Uh, so what happens? The daughter of Pharaoh, she, in the end, she saves Moshe. He's raised in the palace of Pharaoh. It's very ironic how God works. You know, he's like, uh, Pharaoh, you wanted to destroy the children by putting them in the river. I'm going to, your own daughter is going to save the, 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 the Jew from the river. Now, what I didn't share with you is that the, the, the Medrash tells us that there was a reason, there was a reason that Pharaoh was throwing the boys in the river specifically because he, he was given a vision by his stargazers, his astrologers, that a boy would be born in Egypt that would save the Jews, take them out of slavery, topple Pharaoh's, uh, his, his dynasty. And this fellow would see his downfall in the water. Now, they were having a, a premonition about Moses, whose downfall came through the water, famously with the rock that he was supposed to speak to, and he struck it to bring out the water, and that ended up causing him to not be permitted to enter the land of Israel, and he was forced to uh, be laid to rest outside of Israel. So because they saw that water would be, so to speak, the nemesis of this of this child, they told this to Pharaoh, he, he can be defeated with water. So he said, okay, throw them in the Nile. So they very specifically wanted to destroy this child. Now, when Yocheved put Moshe in the Nile, the stargazers likewise had a vision. They said, the boy that you were seeking to put in the Nile has been put in the Nile. In other words, the visions that the stargazers could see were not exact, they were vague. So they knew there was this boy, they knew that the downfall would be through water, 
they knew that the boy was put in water, but they couldn't see the details. So they thought th throwing the boys into the river was successful, and Moses was indeed, they didn't know his name was Moses, this boy must have been drowned because we see he's been put in the water. And so Pharaoh called off the decree at that time, and his own daughter pulls this child out, brings to the palace, and he's raised on the lap of Paro, little grandpa Paro. Pharaoh is putting baby Moshe on his lap and, you know, bumping him on his lap. Baby Moshe, baby Moshe. And this is the very child that's going to be his downfall. Hashem works in incredible ways. Now, what happens ultimately? Moshe goes out and he sees the slavery of the Jews. He's very moved by their plight. He sees an Egyptian taskmaster master beating a Jew to death. He strikes the Egyptian dead. He buries the body. Later on, he sees two Jews fighting each other, and he says, don't fight one another. And they say, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian. And he says, oh, no, the, the, this matter has become known. And he runs away. Uh, Pharaoh finds out. He puts, a, he puts a, a, a bounty on Moshe's head, so to speak, that he needs to be killed. And Moshe escapes to Midian. Long story short, he meets Jethro. And he marries Jethro's daughter, Zipporah. They have children together. He becomes the shepherd for Jethro. And as he's shepherding, he comes upon the burning bush. Now, there's a whole story. There's more to it. We'll see how much we can cover. He gets to the burning bush, and God begins to speak to him. And God tells him, you're going to be the savior of Israel. I'm going to send you back to Egypt. You're going to take the Jews out. And Moshe, he's very reluctant. He says, who am I? I can't do it. I can't speak. I don't have the ability to send someone else. He's extremely, extremely reluctant. Now, in this, in this whole back and forth, uh, here it is. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 2, God says, this is after Moses, they're not going to listen to me. God says, he says, he says to Moshe these words. What is this in your hand? And Moshe replies, A stick. A stick. So again, Rabbi Wallerstein, or Zachary Wallerstein, he used to look at this verse and say, what in the world is going on over here? The creator of heaven and earth is speaking to you. And he asks you what's in your hand. You think he doesn't know what's in your hand? You don't think you need to think deeper about what he's asking? This is this can't be a face value question. What is in your hand? And Moshe answers him a stick. You think he doesn't know it's a stick? What kind of an answer is this? And here's Moshe, the greatest of all prophets. And he gives such a simplistic answer. And he says the question can't be simple and the answer can't be simple. So what is the meaning of this question and what is the meaning of this answer? Now I'll grant you that this is not what we would call the plain meaning. But Rabbi Wallerstein wanted to see in here a deeper meaning that we are meant to take out. He said, when, when God says to Moshe, what is in your hand? What he really was saying to Moshe is, what is in your ability? What is within your ability? And the, the hand is used throughout the Torah and the Tanakh to be a, to be a euphemism for ability and strength is the hand. He says, what is your ability? What is your strength? What is your power, Moshe? And Moshe responds to him, mate. He says, a stick. A stick. Now, why does he say that? Now, number one, the word mate, which means a stick, also means a branch. What is a branch? A branch is an extension. A branch is an extension of the trunk of the tree is the branch. He, so number one, he's saying, I'm, I'm a branch. I, 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 I'm not my own person. I don't have my own faculty. What I am is I'm an extension of something greater. I'm an extension of a greater source. I'm an extension of a unified beginning point. Not only that, a stick, what's a stick? A stick is a lifeless piece of wood when it's on the ground, it has no power whatsoever. Saying you're a stick is like saying I have no power. However, however, if someone picks up a stick, he can use that stick to accomplish very powerful tasks. 
because that stick can be used as a very powerful tool or weapon in the hand of the wielder. And the, the power within the stick is dependent upon the power of the one who wields the stick and the skill of the one who wields the stick. And that's what Moshe was saying to Hashem. Hashem says, what is your ability, Moshe? And he says, my ability is intrinsically nothing. However, I can be a tool that can be wielded with ultimate power if I will be wielded by the ultimate power, so to speak. If I will be your servant, God, and I will be your tool, your vessel to accomplish your will in this world, then my power becomes infinite because my power is your power. But I recognize that I myself have no power. I myself am nothing. I'm zero. You're infinite. And what am I? He said, but through that recognition of submitting myself to your will, to your will, then in your hand as your vessel, I have as much power as you have, which is infinite power. I'm at once everything and nothing depending on if I connect myself to you, if I make myself an emissary for your will in this world. And what a powerful lesson that Rabbi Wallerstein taught us. He said, we have no power. We can do nothing. None of us can do anything in this world because everything's in God's control, not our control. But if we put ourselves in God's control and we say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to be? What do you want me to accomplish? Then there's no limit to what we can accomplish because we are moving forward with the power of Hashem. And here was Basia stretching out her hand, so to speak, to do the will of God, to save this baby Moshe. And Hashem gave her power beyond what seemed natural for her. So though her arm naturally only had a certain length, beyond the natural, she was able she was able to succeed in ways that would be impossible otherwise. And that's such a powerful lesson that we need to take in our lives. We have so little power and yet so much power, depending on whether we connect ourselves to Hashem and are working to fulfill His will in the world. And if we're doing that, we, we should stop at nothing. We should never doubt ourselves. We should never say, so to speak, who am I, what am I? That's only if we're looking at ourselves as disconnected from God. But if I'm living a life that's godly and I know what's right and I want to accomplish it, then I should really spare nothing in the pursuit of that. And I shouldn't doubt myself because when I connect myself with Hashem to perform that, I'm able to do anything even beyond what seems natural and, po and what's possible. So now... I wanted to relate this to a beautiful story that I heard from my uh, the, the head of one of the yeshivas where I learned, Rabbi Mendel Weinbach of blessed memory. He told the story of the Blujiva Rebbe. Now the Blujiva Rebbe, a Rebbe is a Hasidic reb, rabbi who is the head of a Hasidic group is called a Rebbe. And the head of the Bluzheva group, and these groups are all named for cities in Europe where they came from, the head of Bluzhev was known as the Bluzheva Rebbe. I don't even know what his name was. I'm sure he had one, but he's known as the Bluzheva Rebbe. And the Bluzheva Rebbe, he lived very, until fairly, fairly recently. And it's, uh, these stories are verified. These stories are verified. The Bluzheva Rebbe was in the concentration camps during the Holocaust. And he, thank God, survived. But he went through and he saw and he witnessed terrible, terrible things, the lowest, worst that humanity has to offer. And one of the, and he has many stories, many uplifting stories of how he was able to help Jews in the camps to have strength to go on, to have the willingness to live. And in one of the stories, the Blujava Rebbe befriends a young Jew in the in the camp who's a secular jew he's not a religious jew and many jews at the time were not faithful to judaism many jews lost their faith in this terrible time and no one can judge them for that 
we don't know if we would go through such a thing, how our faith would come out intact. We can never judge. But he tried to strengthen these people and he befriended this young non-religious man and, and they developed a, a close and warm friendship. Now on one occasion, the Nazis, as they were wont to do, unfortunately, rounded up the prisoners in the camp and they marched them into the forest. And there were these death marches where they would basically march the prisoners to death, walk them until they would just drop from lack of strength and shoot them on the spot. Now, in this march, they brought the Jews to a very wide ditch in the middle of the woods. And they told the prisoners to line up along the edge of the ditch. And then they said to the prisoners to turn around, face towards the ditch. And they said, you're going to jump over the ditch. And if you make it to the other side, we'll let you live. But if you don't make it to the other side, if you fall into the ditch, we will shoot you dead. And this was just meant to torment the Jews because the ditch was too wide to cross. And the Nazis basically wanted to taunt the Jews before they shot them anyway. They said, if you don't jump, we shoot you. If you jump and you don't make it to the, to, over to the other side, we shoot you. What they wanted to do is they wanted to see the Jews jump and fall in. And they would get a good laugh while they executed them. Absolutely disgusting. Doesn't cover it. So that's what happened. The, these Jews would lined up along this, this wide ditch. They began jumping. And one by one, they would be shot as they fell into the ditch. And the young man turned to the blues of a Rebbe who was standing next to him. They stood side by side at the ditch. And he said, Rebbe, I'm not going to jump. I'm not going to give the Nazis the satisfaction. I'm going to turn and I'm going to face them when they shoot me. I'm not going to give them the dignity of, of watching me jump and fall. I'm going to die with, with my dignity intact. I'm going to turn to face them and let them shoot me to my face. And the blues of a Rebbe said, no. We have to jump. And he said, what are you crazy? We're, we can't make it. We're, it's impossible. Why even try? He said, no, we have to try. We are obligated to try to save our lives. If it fails, it fails. We have to try. He says, we're going to jump. And they turned, they turned towards the, the ditch and they jumped with all their might. And they landed safely on the other side. And the Nazi who was going to shoot them was so shocked. He was so shocked into stillness when he saw this that he, he didn't move. And they just ran. They ran and they escaped. Now, when they reached some relative safety, the, this non-religious Jew turns to the Rebbe and he says, Rebbe, how did you get over the ditch? Not a young man. I don't know how old he was, but how did you get on over the ditch? And he said, I thought about all the ditches in Jewish history. There were so many of us that had to jump over a ditch. Abraham was thrown into the fire. Isaac was put on the altar. Jacob had to run from his brother and he was, he was, persecuted by his uncle Lavan nearly to death and the tribulation he went through with Joseph and the slavery in Egypt and the destructions and the exiles and the inquisitions and the crusades and the pogroms. He said, so many ditches we've had to cross. And here we are. We managed to, up until this point to cross all the ditches. And you know how we did it? Because... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they jumped over the ditch. And the generations that followed, they held on to the coattails of their forefathers. And they were carried over the ditch with them. He said, and when I jumped over the ditch, I grabbed onto the coattails of my ancestors. And they carried me over the ditch. And then he said, but you, young man, You've abandoned your faith. You've ab abandoned your tradition, the ways of our ancestors. 
how did you get over the ditch? And he said, Rebbe, I held on to your coattails and I got over the ditch. A person can do anything if they hang on to great coattails. Now in this story, he hung on to the coattails of his ancestors. In what I'm saying is, or maybe we could ask the question, again, the ans their, his ancestors were hanging on to Hashem. Ultimately, we need to attach ourselves to Hashem. And if we could attach ourselves to Hashem, we can, we can cross any ditch. We can stretch our arm as long as it needs to stretch. But we know there's a beautiful, I mean, it reminds me of a beautiful verse in Zechariah, Zechariah, very famous, chapter 8, verse 23. It might be 22 or 23, depending on which Bible you read. But we know this verse, and it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days, ten men from every language of the nations will hold on, it says, to the the corner of the of a Jew's garment says kanafish Yehudi. Kanaf a kanaf means a corner. So they translate as the hem, the edge. The the hem of a Jew's cloak, as it were, saying, Let us go with you, because we heard that Hashem is with you. And that has its own meaning in its context, and it has many deep meanings. But I think in this context also, what does it mean that the people of the nations come to the Jewish people and they hold on to their hem and they say, let us go with you because now we know that God is with you. Because the Baruch Hashem, thank God, the Jew Jewish people have brought to the world the Torah. The Jewish people have brought to the world the knowledge of Hashem. And it's with that knowledge of Hashem that we've been able to hold on to Him and cross over all the ditches in our history and all the ditches in our lives. And that's the knowledge that we share with the world. Do you want to live a better life? Do you want to make the world a better place? But it looks so impossible. There's so many imp impediments. There's so much in front of us. Hold on, hold on. Because we, we've got the connection. We've got the connection. Now, does that mean that you, you, you now, of course, there is, there is that idea of attaching yourself to a Jew. It's not physically, it's not physically. But learning from the Jewish people, learning from the Torah in such a way that improves your lives, that connects you to Hashem through that chain. And then you can hang on to the coattails and you can go over any obstacle. So I told this story before in another class and I wanna say it again, cause it's relevant and it's beautiful. The story of Valentin Patatsky. So those of you who remember that class, I don't even remember which class it was. The story of Valentin Patatsky who was a Polish nobleman. He was a Polish nobleman that converted to Judaism in maybe the 18th century. And this Polish nobleman converted to Judaism at a, at a time that it was illegal to do so upon penalty of death. The church would execute a person who would convert to Judaism. Now that's a whole other story. It's one of the reasons that conversion became so much more rare in Judaism is because we were forbidden from doing so from so for so long upon such severe penalties that even though it did happen it happened that had to happen very secretly and you know obviously very rarely and that's a little bit vestigial of that why conversions are so difficult today and rare but that's a story for another time but in any case he was a person who managed to get himself converted at a time that the Jews were afraid to do it the non-Jews wouldn't think of doing it, and yet he was so drawn to the Torah and to Judaism, and his soul knew that this is where he belonged, that he he made it happen. He made it happen. He came to the Jews and wouldn't take no for an answer, and, you know, they couldn't get rid of him, so they had to get rid of him. In any case, because of this law, he had to flee Poland and live in another country with another identity, and live Jewishly that way. However, unfortunately, he was spotted. He was recognized. He was discovered. He was uh, kidnapped and extradited back 
to Poland where they tried him and you can imagine how fair that trial was. Uh, although the truth is, I guess he was guilty of breaking that disgusting law. And they sentenced him to death by burning at the stake. And as he was in prison awaiting his death, he was visited by the Vilna Gaon, the great, uh, the genius of Vilna, so to speak, Rabbi Elijah of Vilna, known as the Gaon or the genius of Vilna, very famous rabbi. And the Gaon of Vilna spoke to him prior to his execution and tried to offer him words of comfort, assure him his place in the world to come, etc. And Valentin, Count Valentin was, was unsatisfied. And the Vilna Gaon asked him, what is bothering you? And he said, what's bothering me is this. What's bothering me is that, you know, when you Jews pass on to the next world, you have your ancestors waiting for you there, your righteous ancestors that earn the share in the world to come. And you're going to come and rejoin your loved ones and they're going to welcome you. He says, I, I'm a convert. I don't have a father. I don't have children. I don't know for a fact if he didn't have children, but I'm not aware that he did. He said, I'm going to be alone in the next world. And that loneliness makes me very sad. So even though I know I'm righteous and I know that I'm going to the next world, I don't feel like I have something to look forward to like you do. And so here the Vilna Gaon sh shared with him a, a, a medrash on a verse in Isaiah. This is Isaiah 44, verse 6. And it says, thus says Hashem, King of Israel and their Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And aside from me, there is no God. Now here, there is a, a medrash that says as follows. What does it mean I am the first? I am the first means I do not have a father. Says God, I do not have a father. There is no one that preceded me. I am the last means I have no son. Uh, there is, I'm not, I'm not going to end one day and someone's going to take over the family business, right? And aside from me, there is no other. But the Vilna Gaon said, and this was something the Vilna Gaon used to do, is he studied many, many manuscripts to make corrections on printed versions that became popular when there were errors. So he would study manuscripts and he would make emendations. So what, according to this story, now I wasn't able to verify the story, but I did hear the story and I think it's beautiful. He said that this is a, this medrash is actually uh, not an accurate text. And the accurate manuscript doesn't say, I am the first, I have no father, I am the last, I have no son. But rather, Ani Rishon, I am the first means, I am the father for those who have no father. Vani Achron, and I am the last, means I am the son for the one who has no son. Meaning, said the Gaon, perhaps when I pass away, I'll go to my father, my grandfather, and other relatives. He says, but your father is Hashem directly. Hashem will embrace you as his son very, very directly, such that this was how I related it in that Parsha class. Now it's coming back to me. We talked about the inheritance of a convert. When a convert dies without a next of kin, who inherits him? And the Torah commands that his property is inherited by the priests. And we asked why that should be. And so we answered that just as the priests are the, they're called the portion of God. So, so too, the portion of God are those who have no one else, the convert, the, the, the orphan, the, the widow, the poor, etc. God says, these are mine. These are mine. These are my children because they have no one else to take care of them. I take responsibility for them. So in the same way, the convert who comes to God and doesn't have family. So God says, I'm your family. I'm your father. I'm your son. 
And so in this way, the Vilna Gaon was able to comfort Valentin that he will be embraced directly, so to speak, in the arms of Hashem himself. And the reason I tell this story is because if you are a person who feels like, okay, the Blush of a Rebbe, that's great for someone who has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in his ancestry to hold on to. But what do I do if I'm a, a Ben Noach, a Bas Noach, that doesn't have such ancestry? So the verse in Zechariah says, connect yourself to the Jewish people and you'll have the same attachment. But I'm telling you something even more. You can connect directly to God. I'm not going against what it says in Zechariah. I'm telling you what he may mean is, how do you attach yourself to God? Is you, is you learn from the Jew, you reject the false ideologies that exist outside of the Torah framework, and you, you learn from the Jewish people the truth, the Torah, the Tanakh, Hashem, and you build that relationship, and you make Hashem your father. And Hashem says, I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm your father. That was the message of Valentin, of uh, the Vilna going to Count Valentin. I think, with the, and again, the same message, with that attachment, with that attachment, if we could be the stick, we could be the branch, we could be that extension of Hashem. If we can be that vessel in the hand of Hashem, we attach ourselves, we plug ourselves in, our power is infinite. There's nothing we can't do. Oh, you can't reach? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because you can do anything when you put yourself in the hand of Hashem. I'll tell one last story. And I think this is going to be it. And I know it's a little shorter than usual, but I do have to run a little bit today. There's a story of an Air Force pilot. His name is Brian Udall. Now, I heard this story they, when I heard the story, they said his name was Brian Udell. Now, I, but later I looked into it. It turns out his, his name is Udell. And, uh, and even though it's a funny sounding name, they called him Udell the Noodle. That was his nickname, Udell the Noodle. And I don't know if he got the nickname after the story I told you, which would be apropos or for some reason even before. But the story of Brian Udell is he was an Air Force pilot and he was in a squadron of four planes and they were doing a routine exercise. And while they were doing this training exercise, he noticed that there was a malfunction in his plane because he could tell that the plane was accelerating just from listening. He could hear the acceleration of the plane. He was trained to hear that. And yet his readout was telling him that the plane was not accelerating and it couldn't, and, and also, so what did he do? He checked the secondary readout, it was like the backup readout that he doesn't usually check. And that one was showing, not only was he accelerating to close to the speed of sound, but his, his, his plane was also losing altitude very rapidly. And based on his readouts, he told his, his weapons officer, because there were two, two officers in this plane, he said, we need to bail out right now. And when he said that, when he saw the readout, they're already going, 600 miles an hour, and they were at 10,000 feet. Now, by the way, 6, 000, 600 miles an hour is the maximum safe speed for ejecting from a plane, and 10,000 uh, feet is the maximum safe altitude for bailing out of a plane. But that was by the time he saw the readout. By the time he gave the order, and reacted to the order to actually bail out, the, the plane had accelerated well above the speed of sound and was about a thousand feet from the ground. And when they ejected out of the plane, these two men were hit by such a powerful shock wave, as one might imagine, that the weapons officer was killed instantly and Udall, Udall's body was so badly smashed that he his right arm was totally dislocated. One of his arms, I don't remember which one it was. One of his arms was completely dislocated. His, I'm sorry to be a little gruesome. His knee was basically, one leg was basically disconnected at the knee, although the bottom part of the leg was 
hanging with some flesh. His other leg, the ankle, was pretty much dangling with from just dangling with some flesh and sinews, otherwise totally removed from his leg. His his face was was swollen to the size of a basketball. His body was just covered in cuts, and he descended in his chute into the middle of the ocean, which, by the way, sharks live in the ocean, and he's bleeding in the water. But what ejects with him is an emergency flotation device that's attached to him. So he was able, with his one arm, no working legs, and his other arm dislocated, to swim to his flotation device, grab onto it, and he needed to pull his entire body weight onto the raft, basically before he would run out of strength and drown or get eaten by sharks, who are meanwhile busily getting attracted to the blood he's letting into the water. He he's he's trying with all his might and he is not able to get into this raft, and he's in terrible pain. He's n nearly losing consciousness. He's got no strength left. Can imagine a person in such a condition. The, these giant waves are washing over him, threatening to drown him. And just as he feels like it's time to die, he lets out one final cry. And he says, God, I need your help. And he says, a wave came and lifted him up onto his raft. And he was able to pull himself onto his raft. Now, the raft itself was basically like a donut, and it had a bottom that was sagging into the water. So he's still in the water, and he has to blow up the walls and bottom of the raft in basically to create a shelter until he could be rescued. And he, with his one good arm, he grabs the, 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 the tube that he has to blow into. And he's trying to blow into it, and he can't form a seal with his lips because his face was so swollen and like jelly, and his lips had grown out grotesquely, and he couldn't seal his lips around this tube. So what he did was he, is he took his lips in his hand and pressed them, pressed them around the tube and blew through it until he inflated this this little shelter, the, the bottom and the walls in the middle of the ocean and had to wait several hours till they realized he was missing and sent out a, 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 a team to find him and he was airlifted to safety. And you could only imagine what the recovery for that guy looked like. I believe as far as I know, he was able to get back the use of his arms and legs after a long recovery. And I believe he was a even able to go back to piloting again after that. When I heard that story, I was so moved by the power of, number one, the power of prayer. This man was, I mean, as close to death as you can get. And with a, a heartfelt plea to Hashem, he was saved. But I think of that one good arm and the possible way that he needed to save his life. And I think of this verse in Exodus of there was Moshe, the savior of Israel, suspended in the water. What's gonna what's gonna be? What's gonna be his fate? And the daughter of Pharaoh, who was God's emissary here, to save him, and she sees him, and he's too far out of reach. Could you imagine if she had said, Can't save him, too far out of reach? Oh well, just gonna go about my business now. And she said, no, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to stretch, and I'm going to stretch, and I'm going to stretch. And God helped her, and she reached that child. And the rest is history, ladies and gentlemen. I wouldn't be here talking to you if not for that. That, that stretching of the arm. And there was Brian Udall with his outstretched arm. And how much do we hear of the outstretched arm in the story of Exodus? It's all very evocative. It's all very symbolic. And the arm of Moses, what is in your hand? The stick, the extension, the extension of, of, of the arm 
the extension of God. When he, when Yudo in those moments, he made himself an extension of God. He reached out to God with his one good arm, so to speak, but with his spiritual arm, he reached out and grabbed onto Hashem. He, he grabbed onto the coattails. He grabbed on. He said, God, I need your help. And he was saved. And he was saved. When we connect ourselves to God, we can do absolutely anything. Just like the daughter of Pharaoh was able to reach her arm beyond its limit to save Moshe, the entire Jewish people, and essentially in the entire history of humanity. The Bluj of Rebbe, who was able to reach over that impossible ditch, hold on to the coattails of his ancestors and connect to God and be saved. The nations of the world were able to hold on to the coattails of the Jewish people and connect to God. And every single one of you that can connect to God yourself, reach out, connect, hold on tight, stretch that arm, and you can accomplish anything you seek to accomplish. And with that, we'll conclude the class. And that was a much. very inspirational and very touching lecture today, that's for sure. So, as usual, thank you, Rabbi. I know uh, I'm really happy about your new studio. <laughs> thank you. Uh, just, just, uh, uh, yeah, I was going to show people your green screen, but they, it's clear you have one. So, that's really great. Should I show them? <laughs> it's clear. But it's clear you have one. It's always uh, like oh, that lousy the, green screen effect. No, that, 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 that actually, is, actually having the green screen the wall, effect so. is, is more is more the good part. <laughs> it's not the lousy thing at all. It's actually just the opposite. So this is the green screen. I'll let you guys, so that's how we are able to pull that off. I think it's pretty cool myself. So, but Rabbi, thank you so much again for your time and we'll look forward to seeing you all same time, same place, as Shim willing next week. Actually next week, I won't be in town probably in time. So next week, if we record it, you and I can record it um, maybe before uh, at a different day if you have it available on an evening and then I'll still have it go live at the same time but you can get back with me on that if you want to so thank I you Rabbi to play it by ear I think that sounds good thank you Rabbi and we'll see you guys soon take care everybody Shalom going to the website tanaktalk.com T-A-N-A-C-H T-A-L-K dot com thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk Shalom